Hey, what's going on everybody? It's Jason Lucchese and welcome to this video. I'm so excited that you're here. I asked you guys in the group if you would like for me to bring my attorney, Mr. Matthew Griffith, on to answer some of your legal questions that obviously I cannot answer, but he can. Uh, we've been working together for, you know, years and years and years. Probably we've known each other for you know, well over a decade. So uh, I, I trust the guy. He's done amazing things for, you know, me, my family. Uh, so I'm just so blessed to have him as a friend, uh, as a professional that could help uh, steer me in uh, the right directions. And, and he has. Uh, he's definitely pointed me in the right directions and said, dude, why are you doing that? It's so stupid. So he's, he's a great guy. I love him. And uh, Matthew, welcome uh, to today's video. I appreciate you taking time to do this, my man. Sure. My pleasure. Awesome. I asked Here to serve. So uh, if you guys uh, have not heard of uh, Matthew uh, Griffith, he's with uh, Griffith Exadius uh, Law Group, and he's here based out of Indianapolis. But you're also uh, licensed in Florida, correct? No, I, I'm a real estate investor in Florida. I'm gotcha. not licensed in Florida. So I, I do real estate transactions myself as an investor. Gotcha. Gotcha. In Florida. Yeah. I had that had that confused here. So we're gonna hop right into to questions. You guys left some some really good ones here. And uh, I'm gonna have Matt uh, answer them the best that he can. Now I want you guys to know Matt's gonna be at our event, uh, the Asset Manager Millions Live, and every time Matt comes, uh, the the crowd is absolutely uh, I don't want to say in awe, but they, they are I pretty say, much. I would say in awe. <laughs> I would say in awe. <laughs> they, they really are because Matt really opens up the eyes, uh, especially with what you're, you're able to do as a real estate investor. And there's so many misconceptions. And some of the questions that we have, uh, you know, these are some of the ones that Matt really, really loves. Uh, so let me go ahead and hop in. Uh, so here, I really wanted to get this one from Kevin. Kevin was asking, and I love, you and I have touched on this before on, on some live videos. Kevin's but. in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so Kevin, so sorry, trouble. sorry for in advance, uh, but <laughs> forming a Wyoming LLC versus home state pros and cons. Because I, Matt, Kevin, I don't believe lives in Wyoming, but I think he's probably been on some of those webinars where people are pitching the whole Nevada and Wyoming and south or north dakota so what's your what's your take on that matt well okay so the ge the general rule is form an entity in the state where you reside because you should know more about those laws you should be more familiar with the requirements to maintain that entity um, and then and then you may depending on the nature of your investments you may have to register that entity in a foreign state possibly so I'll give you I'll give you an example. That's a general rule. That usually works really well. It works really well for landlords because land, landlords are landlords are going to have to pay taxes. Uh, if you have income tax in your state, you're going to have to pay income taxes in your home state anyway where you reside. A lot of people think they're going to avoid taxation, income taxation at the state level by forming an entity in another state. That's just not true. So uh, for example, I have an Indiana LLC that owns real estate in Florida. I registered that in that entity in Florida. So it's a foreign entity in Florida because it's an Indiana based entity. I know how to work the Indiana entity. I maintain it in Indiana in Indiana and it's cheap. Indiana is very inexpensive. It's like 90 bucks to form an LLC. And then, and then it's like say round up 30 bucks every other year to maintain it. Super cheap. Illinois by way of uh, contrast is very expensive. They are so expensive, they recently lowered their fees to create an entity in Illinois because so many companies were fleeing Illinois and coming to Indiana to mm -hmm. form LLCs and corporations. That's how high their fees got. It got crazy. Um, so that's a general rule. That's a, that's a good general rule. But let me give you an example of, of a situation where I, I told a client to just form an Indiana entity. A California investor. She has a partner in Indiana. They're going to rehab properties in Indiana. So it could be a rehab or it could be hold. Um, because she has a partner here, 
I said, just you two just form an Indiana entity. You already have an Indiana person. She's the primary investor. Um, so she's got a smaller role partner, um, but they're going to do deals in Indiana. So they're already going to have a connection here in Indiana. They have a person here in Indiana. So for her, it made sense to form an Indiana entity, not California. California is really expensive, like Illinois. The yeah. filing fees and the maintenance fees for, for an LLC in California are outrageous. So people want to avoid those fees so they can save hundreds and hundreds of dollars by filing an Indiana entity. What I never recommend is that you form an entity in a state where you're not doing business or you don't live, which is the whole Nevada, Oklahoma, or whatever thing. It's crazy. Like You have no connection to Nevada. So you form an entity in Nevada, and now you're subject to the law in Nevada plus whatever state you're in. So if you live in Wisconsin and you're doing deals in Illinois, which I don't know why you do deals in Illinois, <laughs> <laughs> but um, probably you could buy good you could get good deals in Illinois because everybody's fleeing the state. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of extra property in Illinois. Yeah. But if you lived in Wisconsin, you're doing deals in Illinois and you you only go to Vegas to hang out for a weekend, right? <laughs> Why form a Nevada entity? That makes no sense. Right. It makes no sense at all. But people do it because they get schnookered into this idea that you can save taxes or there's special asset protection, and it's all myths. If you're in Illinois doing business in Illinois, you're subject to Illinois law. Sorry, you are. If you don't like Illinois law, don't go to Illinois. Don't do deals there. I, I like the word that you snookered. I haven't heard that one in a, in a very long time. Snookered. Uh, I'm old school. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I think the rule of thumb is what? You got to live there 51% of the time. Same rule goes like for, for Puerto Rico if you want to try and avoid uh, taxes there too. Yeah, you have to be a resident. Right. You have to be a resident and this, each state has its own resident requirements, but that's, that's a mandate. But, but here's the thing on state taxation, you got to be careful because some, some states say, if you make money in our state, you're subject to state taxes. And if you live in a different state, you're subject to taxes, but almost every state has a credit mechanism. So in other words, you don't pay double taxes. You're going to pay the most, the highest rate between the two. So if California income taxes are higher than Indiana income taxes, and you've already paid, let's say you're just an employee, you work in Indiana, but you're considered a California resident, right? That's your home base or whatever. You're going to have taxes withdrawn from your paycheck in Indiana. When you go to pay your California taxes, you, you should get a credit for the taxes you paid in Indiana. So you don't pay them twice. Right. No, that's, that's good. No, great, great answer. Um, we got something here from Spencer Krim, and I. Oh, he's in big trouble. <laughs> well, I, you he's you always so answer this one too at the event. Okay. So we're knocking some of these out so we could actually. Matt's got an amazing presentation that we always have good intentions on going through at the event, but he gets about twenty thirty percent through it. <laughs> Because he's answering questions the whole time. So we're actually knocking out some of these questions. So, Matt, I think yeah. we might be able to get you to 50 or 60% this time. <laughs> so, so Spencer's question is, uh, when he's wanting to buy and hold, which entities should be used for asset protection, a trust or LLC? An LLC. A trust is not an asset protection mechanism. There's two, essentially, for, for Spencer. For Spencer's purposes, there are two kinds of trusts. Um, one is a land trust, and one is an estate planning trust. Those, those are probably the two trusts he's thinking about when he says trust. Um, a land trust merely transfers legal title, legal title, not equitable title. So the ability to use the property, to rent it, to rehab it, all of that's equitable title. Legal title is just whose name is on it. A land trust transfers legal title over to someone else who serves as a trustee. They just hold legal title. Really, the only purpose it serves is to create anonymity. It doesn't do anything else. All the beneficial interests and control belong to the beneficiary, the, the original party, right? Yep. I don't like land trusts because people think that they're 
asset protection tools and they're not. They don't provide any. It's kind of like false hope. It's it doesn't really protect you. And then you got to deal with the trustee. Somebody else has legal title to your property. So if they run off or they get mad or they have creditor claims, you got to fight through all that. You're going to get it eventually. But what a hassle. What a hassle. There used to be um, a strategy where you would find a trustee in a far away state. And the idea was, well, if your land trust ever got sued, um, they would have to go to Seattle to find this guy, right? <laughs> The problem is that the investor's relationship with the guy in Seattle was really limited to just maybe that that trustee role. Yeah. The guy disappears, and now some you go to sell your property, and you got to track down this dude in Seattle, or he dies, or <laughs> right, and you got to like figure out where this guy is, and he's halfway across the country. It's a total hassle. So I'm not a big fan of land trust. It only serves the purpose of anonymity. Yeah. Um, the only entity structures that provide asset protection are the ones that are available by state law in your state that talk about protecting um, the owners and the officers of the company. And they're typically, for investors, it's going to be the LLC, the series LLC, and the corporation. I haven't formed a for-profit corporation in probably 10 years. I form almost exclusively LLCs or series LLCs. And then we work with the client's tax advisor to determine which tax status is best. So an LLC can be taxed as a sole proprietor. It can be taxed as a partnership. It can be taxed as a C-Corp. It can ta be taxed as an S-Corp. I mean, it's an incredibly flexible entity. So I have formed over a thousand LLCs. Um, I mean, if you count all the series, I've probably formed probably 2,000 entities or more. Wow. Um, and I, like I said, it's it's been at least 10 years since I formed a for-profit corporation. It's just not necessary. It has more complexity to it and more requirements, so it's harder to maintain. You can get all the benefits of a S corporation, for example, by forming an LLC and having it taxed as an S. Gotcha. But the LLC is easier to maintain. It's more flexible, so you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have the advantages of a S corp, but the flexibility and advantages of an LLC. Gotcha. No, that makes but sense. You know, to answer his question, he was buying and holding, right? Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I think he. Yeah, for buying holds. Okay, so he's gonna. So he's gonna. He should form an LLC, and then the question is, if he has a partner, uh, if he has a partner. And that could be a spouse. But if he has a partner, then uh, that entity would be taxed as a partnership. Okay. So he would fi he would file a partnership tax return, and then he would have the additional advantage of what we what we call charging order protection, which means his ownership couldn't be attacked. His economic interest could be attacked by a creditor, an outside creditor, but his ownership couldn't be attacked. Gotcha. Um, and there's. We have we have some materials on our website, indiebizlaw.com, in our law library online, and you can read about that concept. It's called charging order protection. But it's not available for a corporation. It is available for an LLC. If he doesn't have a partner, he's just going to be a single member disregarded LLC, probably. Cool. And, I, and folks, I'll make sure to put a link below so you guys can check out Matt's uh, website. It's, it's a vault filled with, you know, amazing information so i highly recommend and encourage you to to check it out for sure um but no great great response to that we've got linda delicio she's uh she's seen you before at um one of our events and uh, she has a question here so talking about llc's can you have several businesses under one llc or do you have to have two you probably <laughs> know the answer to that uh so that's what she put so just wondering what your feedback yes. She can. She could have, if she were a plumber, she could have her plumbing business. She also could have her bakery and she could have her real estate investments all in one LLC. Okay. But she could. But the problem, the problem with that strategy is all of those businesses and all those assets are in one bucket. So if the bucket tips over, it all spills out. In other words, it's all vulnerable. 
um, she probably should explore a new entity structure called a series LLC, which is perfect for real estate investors who have lots of deals or lots of properties. So the way that works is um, you have one master LLC and then you have a bunch of business operations underneath them called a series. And each series has its own bucket of assets and its own bucket of liabilities. Gotcha. Makes so sense. It's about two and a half, three years old in Indiana. It's older in other states. They've had it for a long time in other states. Um, and I would say about maybe a third of the states have it now, 12, 14, something like that. Yeah, and I think Linda's in California. And, you know, it's it's a different world over there. Yeah, I'm not sure if they have the series LLC in California. I don't I don't know for sure. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and there's a second part to Kevin's question. Uh, he said, using separate, possibly layered nominee trusts, unique per property deal uh, with LLC as ultimate beneficiary, is this uh, the best recommended structuring for property acquisition, holding, and disposition, or more complicated than necessary? More complicated than necessary. I mean, the only reason you, again, to use the land, he's doing the land trust is what he's doing. And the only reason to use the land trust structure is if you want anonymity. You don't want your name out there. That's the only reason to use the land trust because it doesn't provide any asset protection. Right. Gotcha. So in his, in his case, he's tra he would transfer legal title of his property to the land trust, but the rest of the title would, would, would remain with the LLC. So the LLC is what gives them the protection and insurance and good contracts. Gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, cool. Uh, we got some other ones here from, let's see. Got a couple more. How, how are we doing on time? We're fine. Okay. So obviously with one of the groups that we're doing right now, we've got our direct deal profits bootcamp. We're showing people how to find, uh, you know, and to, uh, you know, like private equity firms, hedge funds, working with banks and trying to get bulk assets uh, to, to do deals. Now, I personally like to close each deal individually, not as a whole from a bulk standpoint. Um, and I know you and I have talked about that in the past. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Because uh, I believe Ermgard, Irm, she was asking, uh, what's the most efficient way to close a bulk REO package? Well, so if you have financing, if you finance the deal, um, you, you got to consider if the if your lender's going to require cross collateralization. So that means they have a mortgage that cuts across multiple properties. So let's say you bought five properties to make it simple. You bought yeah. five properties and you got financing. They essentially have one mortgage on all of the properties. So if you're going to do that deal, you've got to think about your exit strategy you have to have language, you must have language in the loan agreement, preferably in the mortgage, that allows you to, I call it a strike price, but it's a release price. So let's say that you buy five properties and one of the properties you finance for $100,000, just one, property A, and you, you fix it up and all of a sudden it's worth 160. You put, you know, you create a bunch of equity in it and you go to sell the thing. You need to be able to sell it for 100 grand. Or, I'm sorry, you need to be able to sell it and get the bank to take a hundred grand to release the mortgage. You might have an eight hundred thousand dollar mortgage because it's eight hundred thousand dollar mortgage across five properties, and the bank says, "Well, you don't have a, re a strike price, a release price on this, so then you've got to sell all five together, so you've created you've locked yourself in now most banks are pretty good, they'll work with you, but you really need to negotiate that in advance. Um, when, when I do bulk deals, we usually take the appraised value and let's say that it's a seven, 70 LTV. And so then we'll tell the bank, okay, um, we will, we want the strike price to be 80, something more. So we're paying the bank everything that they're owed on that property plus a little more. And that makes banks happy. Yeah. No, that's good. No, I like that. But you have you you have to negotiate that in advance. You have to. 
Yeah, and for, for folks that, you know, I just wanted to throw this out there as we're doing this. Um, if you guys are in the Indy area at all, we've got the Indianapolis Real Estate Investors Association here. It's the second Tuesday of every month, and it's from six to about eight-ish, and it's at the Broadmoor Country Club. If you're interested, you know, Matt's there. Uh, we've got a great group of uh board members that are there giving away tons of free content and information. Uh, Matt doesn't go into detail. Well, he does go into detail, but you know, these are questions that, you know, he's doing for me as a, as a favor, but at the uh, Enria event that we do uh, once a month, you know, Matt's there. Uh, it's, it's great from a, an opportunity to, to ask an attorney these types of questions. So if you don't have one in your area, you're close to us, make sure you come in and check us out. It's second Tuesday of every month uh, at the Broadmoor Country Club in Indianapolis. So definitely uh, check that out. That's been something that's been going on now since what, uh, 2011 or 2012? Yeah, I think we've been doing it seven or eight years. Something like that. It's, it's one of the, the best here in uh, Indiana for sure. Uh, so price is, the, the price is right too. It's free. The mission is free. <laughs> Can't, can't beat that. Um, Momed was asking a question. Uh, would you recommend setting up a, a land trust at all? Um, only if, only if you have a psycho ex girlfriend that is trying to find you in the public records, and you want anonymity. You don't know. You don't want. Or, I mean, there's just. That's the only purpose it serves is it just keeps your name off the title. Yeah. But, you know, I'm going to find you. Um, you know, if I'm a plaintiff's lawyer, or, you know, my client is the tenant and my, she cuts herself on a broken window that you were supposed to fix or whatever, you know, there's a gas explosion or something crazy. You're going to, you're going to get caught. I mean, it's just, they're going to find your interest in the real estate if something bad happens. So it only keeps your name out of the public record as the deed holder. That's the only purpose it legitimately serves. And I, I have some, a few conspiracy theory type clients that think they're <laughs> going to hide from the government. And, you know, they, they also don't, don't drink fluorinated water and all kinds of weird stuff. Like they just don't want their name in the public record. That's really, really important to them. So they use land trust. It's a total waste of time, but they do it. It doesn't, it's it from an asset pricey, protection right? perspective. Do it. They could get pricey too, right? Yeah. I mean, I do them pretty inexpensively because it's just a form and an extra deed. Oh, okay. But then you got to find a trustee and it can't be you. I mean, really should be somebody else. So then you're dragging okay. somebody else in. So I don't, I just don't, I've had some client, some bad client experiences over the years, you know, where we've had to trace more than once where we've had to find the trustee. We've had to track down the trustee. Yeah. Um, I've had situations where the trustee I've represented land trustees and they've got sued and we have to explain to these plaintiff lawyers who don't understand real estate and don't understand land trust that you can't sue the land trustee. Right. You can't sue the land trustee. The land trustee has no liability. He just holds legal title. So you got to explain that. But try explaining that to city government. If you're the land trustee and you're holding legal title, right, and there's a health code violation, guess whose record gets hit? The land trustee. Right. And you think city hall is going to sit down with you and say, gosh, now that you've explained this to me, we'll just change our record. No, they don't do that. It's government. Government doesn't care about you. Government's here to serve government, not people. So you're going to get hosed if you're the land trustee. There are just so many problems with them. Yeah. But there's, you know, there's some legal witch doctors who have been on the circuit for years selling this concept without really any practical experience in using them. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. There's a lot of the, the stuff going out there about that. Uh, we just have it always has been. We have two questions left, um, and then I know you're busy, so we'll we'll uh, we'll let you get get back going. Uh, we've got Chuck was asking, uh, when should an LLC be created for your real estate business? Uh, 
when you're doing business before you make the purchase offer. Yeah, that's what I recommend, especially, you know, Matt, like it, we live in Indiana, it's setting up an LLC and keeping it um, is so, so, you know, inexpensive. So I always yeah. recommend to folks get it set up like, you know, you're, you're forming a business. So you could obviously do stuff as a sole proprietor, but uh, the, the benefits outweigh getting an LLC set up versus doing a sole proprietor. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, there, there's no reason if you're going to – here's what I tell people. So people come, come to me and I'll help them form an LLC and they'll ask, well, when should we do this? We, haven't, we don't have our first property. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I assumed when you walked in the door to meet me in my office that you were serious about doing business. <laughs> oh, we are. We are serious about doing business. I said, okay, then let's form a business, <laughs> right? Because – so you are supposed to own the business. You're not supposed to be the business. The business is a separate legal entity. Right. You happen to run it. You speak for it. It's a legal fiction, right? So it can't pick up a pen and sign contracts. So you're going to have to do that in your, your representative capacity. But the business is over here. It's called an LLC. You just happen to be the guy that owns it and runs it. So if you're serious about business, then form a business and do it yeah. right. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of signing a purchase agreement in their personal name and then say, oh, I better do the LLC. Um, I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think the right way to do it is to form the LLC, have the LLC be the purchaser on the purchase agreement. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how I've done it since day one is that that's how we've always purchased, uh, properties or held them. Um, so last question, uh, comes back circles around to Imgard Kinzer uh, do we have to have a different attorney for each state we do deals and I know you kind of covered this in the beginning just a little bit ago but can we uh, kind of just cover it uh, just a little bit more uh, yeah the answer is probably yes you probably should you probably should if you're dealing with real estate in different states so I probably know a lot of law that applies in all 50 states yeah I Right. Um, maybe not Louisiana, because they have a little bit different system. They have the Napoleonic Code or something based on that. But I probably know a lot of law that is applicable in all 50 states, but I don't know the law in all 50. Um, and I'm not licensed in all 50. So there is there. There's a couple good ways to find a, a lawyer in another state. Um, one is through um, LegalZoom, frankly. And you can become a member of that, and then you can ask questions of lawyers. They have a lawyer in all 50 states. In most states, they have multiple lawyers. So you can actually sign up to ask a question about any state that you're going in. And, and so that's a solution. There's also a resource called Find Law, which I think is owned by uh, Westlaw, F-I-N-D-L-A-W.com, and it is just a directory of lawyers all across the country. Cool. There are other services like Rocket Lawyer, where you can ask questions of lawyers in different states. That's a little hit or miss. The LegalZoom stuff is really good. Those are good lawyers. Um, um, I can't bash for every lawyer under Rocket Lawyer. I know they have some good folks, but I think their network is much broader. So because it's a broader network, you probably hit and miss. And another excellent, excellent way to find a good lawyer is to find a RIA in the state where you're operating, a real estate investment club association yeah so network with other right because i mean think about it most of my clients come to me through other clients so real estate investors get to know me and they refer other people to me and and so you know i've been doing this for 27 over 27 years i've learned a couple things about real estate investing over the years people know that and so they come to me. So I'm a pretty good resource of information and I like to share information and I try to demystify the industry and I try to get people on the right track to do the right thing. I'm a big believer right. in win-win relationships and doing the right thing, follow the law, you know, all the stuff I preach. You need to find some guy like me in each state where you're doing business. And a great way to do that is through RIAs and other real estate investors. Yeah, That's the way, because they're going to know, right? Just like my clients know, I know my stuff. There's another lawyer out there that 
other real estate investors in Montana or Washington State or California. Investors in those states know the lawyers who know their stuff. So get to know other investors, which you should do anyway. You should already be networking with other oh, yeah. investors. For sure. And then they'll have resources for you, right? I asked, well, I asked a, a guy the other day, um, an, another investor guy, I said, hey, I, I got some concrete work I want to do. My concrete guy's like two weeks out. Do you got anybody? He goes, yeah, sure. I can have somebody here tomorrow. And I said, is he good? And he said, yeah, he's excellent. He does all my work. And I know this other investor, so I feel comfortable with that referral. Nice. Right? That's how you. That's how you find CPAs. That's how you find... That's how you find HVAC guys. That's how you find lawyers. That's how you find all kinds of people you need to do this business. Yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, the, the RIAs are great. And again, um, the Enria one that we have, the uh, Indiana Real Estate Investors Association, we meet once a month, second Tuesday every month uh, from six to, to about eight-ish. Uh, and it's at the Broadmoor Country Club. And the cool thing is afterwards, uh, everybody tends to, to meet up. There's a little... Uh, bar lounge area that everybody goes and that's where deals get done. That's where relationships are formed. Yep. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great time. And if you guys want to meet Matt uh, in person at the Asset Manager Millions live event, uh, definitely register for that. Shoot us an email. It's jlucchesevip at gmail.com. So it's j-l-u-c-c-h-e-s-i-v-i-p at gmail.com and put in the subject line AMM live. Uh, Matt's going to be coming. He's going to be uh, speaking on the second day in the morning. And uh, every time we have him come, uh, it's, you know, people always walk away with doing the right, doing, having a better perspective on doing business the, the right way. Uh, so we absolutely love having Matt come. Thank you so much for, uh, sure. you know, you know, definitely uh, letting us know that you're able to come to that. Uh, do you have any parting words for the folks that are watching this? Yeah. Uh, learn the law, follow the law, just <laughs> do it the right way. It's just easier that way. Right. And um, network, ask lots, lots of questions, learn. And, but here's a big one. So this industry is full of really bad information, right? A lot of that. So, so be skeptical about what you hear and only get information from reliable, experienced, knowledgeable folks. So don't take, I, I had conversations just yesterday with people who were doing online research. <laughs> and this, I could just tell from the beginning of the conversation that they had been doing their own research and got completely off track. And I had to demystify all that. I had to say, I had to debunk a bunch of stuff and I had to draw them in and get them back on the right, on the right path. Right. I had to ask them to forget, you know, they spent hours researching stuff. They yeah, could have asked me and I would have given them the right answer in five minutes, <laughs> but they spent hours researching all the wrong stuff. So I had to unteach all the wrong stuff and then teach the right stuff. Right. Jeez. So I, um, I have this discussion with uh, um, with my wife's cousin, who's a doctor. All my wife's cousins are doctors, <laughs> so I have these. Um, they have people that go to WebMD and find stuff, and then they go to the doctor, right? And the yeah. doctor has the same experience. They have to say, "No, you know, you you don't have arthritis. You have whatever, right? You know." Um, and they have to demystify stuff. So get information, but be skeptical of it, and always ask the explanation behind the answer, the explanation behind it, the why. Okay. So you're telling me I should form an LLC. Why? Good advisors will just tell you, you don't have to ask them why good advisors will just explain to you why you're doing what they're recommending. Uh, but always ask the why. And if the why doesn't make sense, then reject that advice and move on to something that does make sense. Right. No, no, that's great advice. I appreciate it. And what's, uh, what's the best website for, for people to check more information out about you? Because I know you got lots of great information that you give away for yeah. free. Indie Biz Law. I-N-D-Y-B-I-Z-L-A-W. IndieBizLaw.com. 
Awesome. And we'll, we'll have that here uh, so that you guys can uh, check out Matt's website. Uh, but make sure you get your seats uh, booked. Uh, we're, I think, at 70, 75% capacity. So make sure you book those seats. Uh, you can send uh, an email, J-L-U-C-C-H-E-S-I-V-I-P at gmail.com. And make sure you put in the subject line, uh, A-M-M Live. And uh, we'll send you all the details. So if you're just interested and you just want to find out more information, just shoot us an email. We'll send you more details. Uh, but that's it. Matt, I appreciate you joining us on today's session. Uh, this was awesome. My pleasure. You always uh, deliver uh, tons of golden nuggets for folks. So thank you. Uh, everybody that asks questions, thank you very much. I appreciate you guys. And Matt, as always, uh, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> awesome, dude. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.